so I, I will introduce uh, to this, today's session uh, and then um, give the floor to Valérie Morrison. Uh, uh, special thanks to her and to Marianne Keating, our artist guest. Um, and then uh, uh, Valérie will uh, discuss uh, uh, works, uh, underwater works and uh, works dealing with water by Irish artists and post-colonial artists. Uh, and then uh, the floor will be given to Marianne and then we'll open the debate and the discussion uh, to the, the public, to the audience. So uh, it's, yes, uh, today's seminar will revolve around um, art because it seems that art as the vehicle of a status is central to thinking through the Anthropocene. Uh, first of all, because art uh, provides us with a non-moral form of address that offers a range of uh, discursive visual and sensual strategies that can develop outside the regimes of scientific objectivity. Uh, to understand the complex issues uh, aggregated within the Anthropocene, uh, it's important to engage with and encounter art uh, because art wants to refuse false hopes, but also uh, the apocalyptic foreclosure of possible futures. So in today's webinar entitled Currents, we have chosen water related art that raises specific ethical questions about water. Uh, its availability, its pollution, its history, uh, highlighting that water is definitely a key element to think uh, our contemporary world and the Anthropocene. Uh, its fluidity, water's currents and currencies deterritorialize established binary narratives and create new models of thinking practices because they provide a unique medium prompting new imaginaries. Uh, so art related to water, be it installed in, above or under it, offers a particularly uh, felicitous performative platform from which we will reflect on the vulnerability uh, of the Anthropocene. The four video installations discussed today uh, will revolve around the multiple and fragmented stories conveyed by the undercurrent of the seas, of the sea. We will um, uh, deal with uh, John Akamfra's works, as well as Ayesha Hamid, Marianne Keating's works, and uh, Ava Nibrian as well, uh, which all exemplify the way this is the repository of colonial history. Um, those works will invite you, uh, viewers, to adopt diverging viewpoints and maybe to reconstruct a common overarching history where the oceans play a central role. Um, so in the four video installations that we will see, the sea holds together the fragments of a shared post-colonial past. Uh, it also, those fragments feature as a natural force, um, a deterritorial, deterritorializing current, a poetic motif and a space where human subjects are submitted to violent power relations. So it's our great uh, pleasure and honor to welcome Valérie Morisson, a senior lecturer at the Université de Bourgogne, Franche-Comté, in Dijon, in France, um, to present today's session and introduce our guest artist, Marianne Keating. Uh, and luckily enough, Ava uh, heard her back while tidying up her studio this afternoon, so she won't be with us tonight. Uh, Valérie will analyze uh, uh, their, their works uh, of art and moderate the roundtable that will ensue. 
so I would like to introduce uh, Valérie very shortly, and then I will uh, um, um, uh, give her the floor. So Valérie has studied Irish contemporary art and its relation with post-nationalist culture extensively. And she has published many academic texts on British contemporary art. Though firmly anchored in art history, her approach stresses the relevance of context in the understanding of visual culture and the arts, and borrows from anthropology to shed light on the position of the artist and the role of art in society. Her publications focus on a wide range of subjects, such as feminist art, memory and the commemoration of history, the Northern Irish situation, post-colonial art, lens-based art, and consistently emphasize field work and praxis in art as key vehicles for expression, analysis, and critique. Her latest book, Locating the Self, Welcoming the Other in British and Irish Art 1919-2020, will be published this very winter by Peter Lang. So be on the lookout for it. And now, uh, uh, Valérie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Anne-Laure, for this uh, presentation. Um, and um, so I'm going to share my screen for everyone to uh, access the images that will accompany my talk. Um, yeah. Okay. So can everyone hear me clearly? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, perfect. So um, I would like first to express my warmest uh, thanks to Anna and um, Anna who have set up this project and devoted so much energy to the organization of this seminar. Um, I'm delighted to be uh, given the opportunity to present four artistic works that um, you mentioned or projects in which the sea indeed and its undercurrents play uh, a central role. I warmly um, thank also um, Marion and Elvi who won't be able to attend this session for their very kind collaboration in this project. Uh, so the four artistic proposals I wish to explore in this talk uh, rely on polyphony and combine a multiplicity of perspectives on issues related to human and non-human oppression. Anthropological decenteredness and post-colonial in-betweenness find a visual echo in the praxis and the paradises elaborated by British artist John Acomfra, uh, British artist Aisha Hamid, and Irish artists Marin Keating and Alvin O'Brien. The conflation of different perspectives through both montage and juxtapositions proposes a detour through otherness, which allows for a reconfiguration of history. The works therefore historicize and politicize ecology. The sea, which is at the core of the works, is much more than a seascape, whether it is moving, literally or metaphorically, or still, it carries along multiple memories and fosters dense interactions between the human and the non-human. Um, obviously, um, each work um, and project would deserve an independent analysis, but I have opted here for a comparative approach, arguing that video montage and multi-screen installations partake of an aesthetics of decentedness. I have therefore selected four works dating from the same period, more or less. Um, Vertigo C by uh, John Acomfra, a three channel video installation, first screened in 2015. Black Atlantis by Ayesha Hamid, an ongoing research led art project initiated in 2015. The Ocean Between by Marion Keating, an exhibition held in Cork in 2019 gathering films and video installations, among which Landlessness, a two-channel video installation produced in 2017, and Inscriptions of an Immense Theatre by Elvin Ibrain, a single-channel channel, um, video triptych dating from 2018. Um, I will first argue that the works contribute to what has become known as the archival multiverse, um, I will subsequently focus on the role of the sea as a poetic motif and a contact zone and borrow from Christina Sharp's analysis of the wake to foreground the ontology of the sea. 
I will then conclude on the decentedness entailed both by praxis and apparatus in the four project. In the archival multiverse, history is revisited through participa sorry, participative or collaborative projects, um, which have significantly transformed the ontology and epistemology of archiving. Artists grappling with the legacy and trauma of history have increasingly used archival documents, so much so that in 2004, Hal Foster described archival art as a practice that draws on informal archives, but produces them as well, and does so in a way that underscores the nature of all archival materials as found yet constructed. The four works I'm discussing tap into um, archival materials, but challenge the categorization and hierarchies underlying the construction of knowledge in Western cultures to offer alternative living polyphonic archives. The artists propose constellations of representations rather than linear narrative. They rely on the collection of fragments and the assemblage of what we could call cultural debris. Vertigacy by John Contra was screened for the first time during the 2015 Venice Biennale as part of Oqui and Wizor's All the World's Future exhibition. The installation comprises three large screens which evoke the parallel histories of the colonization of Africa, slavery, and the exploitation of natural resources. The swift rhythm of the images screened in a seemingly random order on the three screens simultaneously creates a sort of visual hypnosis, leaving the viewers find their own way in the cinematographic multiverse. And I'd like to show you the beginning of um, the video If anyone falls inside, they will eat that person because those fish were very big. Save me, Jesus, save me. Numbers reported dead or missing here this year are the highest ever. Nearly 500. Last month, on one day, 14 dead bodies were found floating in the sea. Jesus, save me. Jesus, save me.
they clambered onto one of these, the tuna cage. Exhausted, unable to swim, stranded. The migrant's boat started taking on water. The people traffickers told them that the crossing would take less than an hour. The pilot swam back to shore. They headed off on what was to become one of the most dramatic survival stories from this year's crossings. So, um, as you um, saw from this first uh, excerpt, uh, Vertigo Sea is made of visual and sound fragments. Some images are from the Natural History Unit of the BBC Archives, where the artist has worked for many years. The videos also include uh, scenes from fictional films and the artistic tableau imbued with a romantic or surrealist atmosphere. The show, um, they uh, show characters uh, in period costumes, as you can see here, stranded in the white landscape and lost in the midst of broken furniture, clocks or domestic items. The soundtrack is equally made up of a variety of sources, radiophonic archives jostled with more personal testimonies or narratives of wreckage, passages excerpted from the writings of Virginia Woolf, Herman Melville, Nietzsche or Heathcock Williams, the author of The Whale of Nation, or recordings of non-human sounds. The work is therefore a collage of fragments belonging to different representational regimes. The assemblage creates a third space at the crossroads between the real and the imaginary at the intersection of history and myth. One of the recur recurring themes in vertigacy is predation. Humpback whales, polar bears or deers are killed after their natural habitat was conquered or colonized. Yet the critique of man's infringement upon nature, which really underlies the work, is complemented by a critical take on the cultural or ideological frameworks which undergird our relation with the non-human world. In Black Atlantis by Ayesha Hamid, similar themes are tackled. The title is connected to Paul Gilroy's The Black Atlantic, Modernity and Double Consciousness, which was published in 1993. Um, this ongoing project takes on a very unusual form as it wavers between poetic performance and academic conference. Each chapter proposes juxtapositions which bring together different objects, voices, times and places. Some audiovisual performances include images shot during Hamid's residencies in the Barbados in 2016, um, as well as TV footage documenting contemporary migrations. Such juxtaposition spurred the viewers to acknowledge the difference between the subjective voice of the narrator, either the artist herself or storytellers, and the authority of institutional voices, media reports or archi archival fragments, for instance. In Black Atlantis Afrofuturism, Hamid insets excerpts from a science fiction film by Neil Belufa Kipinski, or from the film biography of jazz singer Sun Ra, Space is the place um, that was um, shot in 1974, but also of African mythology. So different temporalities coalesce into an imaginary continuum. A wide range of cultural items are brought together during the performances. Reality, critical analysis, and fictitious representations blend, so as uh, do high and low culture. Similarly, subjective images, personal accounts, and a distanced and conceptual understanding of history are juxtaposed, as Hamid also quotes from thinkers and scholars. She evokes Walter ben Benjamin's notion of the dialectical image and his aesthetics of fragments as a source of inspiration and purports to build an active archive. I quote her, using Walter Benjamin's concept of the dialectical image, I examine how to think through sound, image, water, violence and history as elements of an active archive and time travel as a historical method. Her practice unites field work and, field work and critical analysis in a single moment while the two are normally distinct. As is the case in the four projects, the superimposition of objects that are chronologically or geographically dissociated deconstructs our frames of perception and interpretation. Marian Keating, whom I thank very warmly for her interest in this event and her presence, 
um, is an Irish artist and practice-based researcher who was granted several artistic residencies in the Barbados and Jamaica, more precisely at Fresh Milk, a structure and cultural lab interested in diasporic identities, whose location is related to the history of the slave trade. Marion Keating's successive residencies have allowed her to investigate the history of Irish indentured workers who were imported to the Barbados in the 1830s after the abolition of slavery and in the context of Irish families. The end of slavery caused a shortage in cheap labor force and Irish migrants replaced the former slaves on the plantations. These Irish poor were offered free crossing in exchange for free labor once in the colonies. Um, after three or seven years of unpaid labor, they could settle on their own, but obviously seldom did so. The history of these indented workers is largely unknown. As the artist explains, the identification of these workers as slaves tended to de-racialize slavery. Marion Keating has worked in the local archives to document the plight of these migrants and acknowledge the traumatic history of these Irish families whose descendants she interviewed. Her films juxtapose archival material and contemporary films shot during her residencies. In Landless Nest, a two-channel video installation, several visual and textual fragments are juxtaposed. Some excerpts from a conversation which unfolded in 1835 between Alexis de Tocqueville, who then visited Ireland, and John Revens, secretary of the Poor Law Commission, are screened. The dialogue focuses on the causes of misery in Ireland, the adverse consequence of British colonialism and the prospect of importing Irish indentured servants in Jamaica. Excerpts from a second conversation between John Russell, head of the Colonial Land and Immigration Commission, and H. Hendricks, who founded the West India Immigration Society and represented the plantation owners, equally broached the same migratory strategy. Marion Keating uses primary documents in many of her video works, notably in A Riotous Assembly and A Beautiful Dream, two works with a strong documentary dimension. Uh, she weaves together archival material and videos of contemporary street scenes that she shot during her stays in the Barbados. In Below Cliff, a vanishing village, the texts evoking the history of a village populated by former indentured servants serve a documentary function, yet the hypnotic sound of the artists and residents' footsteps among the dry grass as they try to locate the village bestow a poetic dimension upon the film. This soundscape connects the past to the present as it conjures up images of the villagers and the artists roaming the fields and seeking traces of former occupation. The artist has also recorded the voice of a man recalling life in the lost village. So what the viewers witness is the encounter between the artist and the resident, the sharing of a fragmentary narrative rather than the material ruins of the past. The soundtrack, including the oral testimony, evidences the encounter and portrays the artist as a listener, as the recipient of a so far unrecorded voice. In a text related to another of her works, Ayesha Hamid notes that the sonic quality of a film is a central component of its effective quality and connects sound to the nautical. I quote her, sound operates like the animated images as aesthetically, aesthetically immanent to the study of nautical migration. She moors her analysis um, in Chillon's study of audio vision to suggest that sound presupposes movement from the outset and is therefore um, particularly prone to be associated to displacement and migration. Over the last decade, um, there has been a major shift from the paradigm of the artist as an isolated genius to an understanding of the artist as a catalyst of shared energies. While Nicolas Bourriou has placed emphasis on the relationality at stake in the viewing or visiting experience, I'm eager to stress the importance of relations and encounters between artists and the environment in which they work during the groundwork phase of the projects. Artistic fieldwork generates encounters and entails an emphasis on listening, which philosopher David Michael Levin supports. He says, I quote, this may be the time, the appropriate historical moment to encourage and promote a shift in paradigms, a cultural drift that to some extent seems already to be taking place. I'm referring of course, to the drift from seeing to listening, 
and to the historical potential for a paradigm shift, displacing vision and installing the very different influence of listening. While seeing is fraught with notions of power, may carry along voyeurism as well as the objectification of the exotic author and implies the passivity of the observed, listening brings forth mindful intersubjectivity. The presence of singular voices in the four works induces an effective proximity with the narrator or storyteller. During field work, the artists navigate the space between themselves and the other. Their position is comparable to that of anthropologists who elaborate the practice of speaking nearby, advocated by anthropologist and filmmaker Trinti Min Ha, who elaborates a cinema of empathy based on plasticity. Starting from the idea that the divide between the world we observe and ourselves, our inner selves, um, is typical of Western culture, Trinti Min Ha focuses on the constant flow from the inside out and the outside in that the montage in the four works blend the subjective shots of the artist immersed in the site and the voices of others, whether recorded on the occasion of an impromptu encounter or resurrected from archives, instantiates the idea of a flow from the inside out and the outside in. In inscription uh, from an immense theater, Brain associates three different places the Enlightenment Collection Room in the King's Library of the British Museum, a direct provision camp and uh, a limestone quarry um, in Ireland. The soundtrack um, connects the three parts of the video triptych as it is the reading of a text written by Samuel Kitscherberg in the 16th century, um, actually the first treatise on museology. This historical text is read three times with slight variations, but accompanies three different scenes. The text is resurrected through the oral performance and its interpretation reopened thanks to the new constellations that are designed. The text, which has acquired a historical value and authority across the ages, takes on a subjective dimension as the voice, the irregular rhythm, the audible breath, the uneasy poses and moving pitch transforms it into a personal and stable utterance. The archive is therefore given a new life. It is both dismembered and remembered. The four artistic proposals um, actually share much with the genre of the filmic essay um, as defined by Timothy Corrigan, that is to say a form characterized by in betweenness I quote him, straddling fiction and nonfiction, news reports and confessional autobiography, documentaries and experimental film. Film essays are first practices that undo and redo field form, visual perspectives, public geographies, temporal organizations, and a notion of truth and judgment within the complexity of experience. They are a practice that renegotiates assumptions about documentary objectivity, narrative epistemology, and authorial expressivity within the determining context of the un unstable heterogeneity of time and place. In the four works, the viewers constantly have to reappraise their positions in relation to the shifting viewpoints and narrators or witnesses. Chronology is disrupted as past and present intermingle. The repetition of texts, sounds, or images in the four works blurs the chronological and spatial delineations, creating an uncanny sense of déjà vu and felt fostering a sensitive ontology, uh, which I will connect to the idea of the wake. Uh, Michel Foucault and Jacques Derrida's deconstructions of archive um, well, have um, undoubtedly influenced uh, the, the um, kind of um, praxis that the four artists put at play in the works. Um, the artists registered, registered the voices of those who are too often silenced in the grand narratives of history. Hal Foster pointed out that in archival art, the objects, I quote, are recalcitrantly material, fragmentary rather than fungible, and as such, they call out for human interpretation, not machinic reprocessing. The decontextualization of the fragments, their reconfiguration in artistic constellations, opens up multiple interpretations. In his 2011 text, Constituting an Archive, Stuart Hall defined the living archive as, I quote, present, ongoing, continuing, unfinished, 
open-ended. The use of archives and the incorporation of multiple voices in the montage exemplifies Stuart Hall's definition and contributes to the archival multiverse, that is to say, a shared dialogical space which may include oral testimonies and performances. The inclusion of a singular, yeah, sorry, non-authoritative voice leads to the co-ownership of knowledge. As Stuart Hall notes, the living archive resurrects the dead following tracks, putting back together scraps and debris, and reassembling remains is to be implicated in a ritual which results in the resuscitation of life, in bringing the dead back to life by reintegrating them in the cycle of time in such a way that they find in the text, in an artifact or in a monument, a place to inhabit from where they may continue to express themselves. Jacques Derrida's notion of hauntology or spectrality as central to these artistic projects are many ghosts, ghosts sorry, are summoned. In Vertigo see um, Uloda Kiano, a freed African slave, abolitionist and writer who left the colonies to settle in Great Britain, is impersonated and seems to haunt uninhabited and white landscapes as if he embodied the repressed trauma of slavery. And we are going to move to the second excerpt from John Confra's video. Um, let me get a play now, Ramona, please. Based pressures, larger brains evolved, ten times as old as man's. The accumulated knowledge of the past, rumors of ancestors, memories of loss, memories of ideal love. So, um, as I said, uh, ghosts appear in um, the, the, the four uh, works, Black Atlantis, um, sorry, getting lost there, well, never mind. Um, so Black Atlantis revolves around the myth of the persistence of black lives deep in the ocean and the resurgence of the ghosts of slavery. Uh, the ocean um, between and uh, landlessness, more particularly, equally summons the voices of the dead, while in inscriptions of an immense theater, among the images of the quarry, some exotic objects from the British Museum collection appear on stage like, spectral and, uh, like a spectral ancient chorus. These ghosts materialize to tell the repressed story of colonialism, stories of oppression, which are muffled in the galleries where beautiful objects erase the power relations behind their presence in the museum. As the montage is imbued with a plasticity that philosopher Catherine Malabou um, has celebrated, it privileges movement and transformation. History is endlessly reshaped through its echoes in the present. One should therefore not mistake the video installations as being commemorative. The links they draw between past and present aim at reopening the wounds of the past to acknowledge the plurality of stories and understand the present. The analysis provided by Achille Membe, a post-colonial historian of Cameroonian origins is illuminating. He argues that the state tends to consume the past and erase the moral debt we owe to those who precede us. Um, he um, mentions the chronophagy of uh, the state, which erases the violence of the remains. 
In this respect, he conceives of archives as tombs or sepulchre, which tame the violence of the remains. Video montage is a means to de-anesthetize the past as archival materials are screened, texts are read, images of the past are juxtaposed with present one. In the four projects I'm comparing, both land and sea constitute archives in their own right, but what has been buried or submerged resurfaces. The land and the seascape generate ruptures as well as historical continuity. In Vertigo Sea by John Confra, one can hear those words, free from land-based pressures, larger brains evolved, 10 times as old as man's, the accumulated knowledge of the past, rumors of ancestors, memories of loss, memories of ideal love. The sea is obviously the nexus of the work. Um, as I shall explain, it's a geographical space allowing for circulation, the natural habitat of species which will survive us, and to quote from Nora Alta, a reservoir of memory, a place where stories of the past, present and future are suspended and preserved. Throughout the videos, offshore and subsea drillings are documented, early 20th century scientific expeditions are evoked and images of killings of bears and whales are intercut between pictures of a thriving marine life. All the massacres are depicted if they're related to slavery or dictatorship. In the Don't Do Much in the Kinghole Way, a single channel video with sound that was produced in 2019, Marion Keating records the voice of former school teacher Vilde Bulma, one of the descendants of the Irish indentured servants, as they visit her garden in Friedman Hall. The garden is the legacy of the past, but is carefully tended as Vilde grows lemons and other fruit. In her filmic essay, Land Path of Migration, Marion Keating explains, I quote her, all the land we have is secondhand. She further notes in her blog, I quote, I have always been fascinated by the geology of land, how the soil under our feet has been formed, who has passed this way before, and the frequency of such movement. I think of our homogeneous desire to follow the same well-worn path and maneuver inside the marks created in the landscape by those who have come before. The, layer, the land indeed bears the imprint of, imprint of past lives and usages. In landlessness, the juxtaposition of the 1835 dialogue and the contemporary landscapes of the west of Ireland and Jamaica incites us to view places as historically layered. The artist writes, I quote her, land holds the memories of past lives, the coral and limestone sediment on which we stand embeds what has come before and consumes the archives of past experiences, leaving us with few traces, with many details never to be recovered. We trail through all manners of the past archaeology, anthropology and sociology to attempt to reconstruct the narrative, but often the land holds on more traces than it reveals." End quote. This statement could apply to the limestone quarry filmed by Ildini Brain, as it bears the traces of the human exploitation of the rock face, scars in the landscape that bring to my wounds inflicted upon human beings. Catherine Yusuf has coined the phrase geologies of race to draw parallels between the extraction of matter and the exploitation of the subaltern throughout history. I quote her, the human and its subcategory, the inhuman, are historically relational to a discourse of settler colonial rights and the material practices of extraction, which is to say that the categorization of matter is a special execution of place, land, and person cut from relation through geographic displacement. Black Atlantis and the ocean between um, give a poetic form to the notions elaborated by Donna Haraway and Anat Singh, the plantation. In um, Black Atlantis, the plantation is seen, one section is entitled Coast. The unsteady, so this is a steel, and unfortunately it's uh, a bit tricky to, to move to uh, an online um, excerpt from this video, but um, well, it's easy to find it. Um, so the unsteady uh, images of the sea in this excerpt remind the viewer of the physical immersion of the artist shooting the waves um, and they accompany a narrative read by the artist, which recounts the visit of a young woman who feels the weight of the waves on her body and feeling the presence of railway tracks 
in the sand, reminisces about the channeling of sugar during the colonial period. Um, so the coast is here in this excerpt, um, an archive that can be touched, physically experienced. The movement of the sea, the subdued noise of the wind, transformed the knowledge of the past into a lived experience, offering a physical contact with the past. This passage is followed by the evocation of a boat discovered in 2006 off the coast of Jamaica, in which 11 dead bodies were found. The tragic episode is narrated without any image complementing the voiceover as if to materialize the irrepresentability of this traumatic moment. In the boat originally sailing from Senegal to the Canary Islands, but adrift for four months in the Atlantic Ocean, the bodies were desiccated, almost fossilized, Two notes written by the migrants were discovered, published in The Guardian, and are read by the artist during her performance. In Black Atlantis, Ayesha Hamid explores the sea as, I quote, a notion of death and displacement. Just like in Vertigo Sea, several sea-related tragedies are evoked, whether the history of the ghost ships or the death of contemporary migrants trying to cross the sea and reach Europe. As images of maritime surveillance alternate with images of crossings, a female African voice tells mythological stories of sea creatures and voyages. As is the case in Akonfra's video, reality and imagination are interwoven and fuel one another. In another chapter entitled The Weather, Hamid recounts how the sea, the salt, the water have hit human bodies while the ocean has absorbed the corpses of the victims. I quote her, the forces of the sea, its salt water, wind and sun, corrugate and envelop them. They make the bodies a part of the ravages of the sea and connect them to the others, not seen, that fell into the ocean. The sea as a force fossilizes the bodies of these men who died on board, destroying and preserving them. The sea destroys human life, but at the same time cares for the body tends the human remains and absorb the corpses. So human bodies become part of the sea archive. Yes, yet as the artist notes, the force of the water is complicit with that of state power. The zones of contact are multiple in Black Atlantis. The African storyteller mentions the cultural syncretism produced by the contact between the Europeans and Africans, but clashes and disagreements and oppressions are equally referred to. One may relate the evocation of interwoven destinies and the materiality of the sea in the four works to the transcorporeality elaborated by Stacey Alaimo to suggest that we co-evolve with the sea and are part of, rather than separate from the unknown future of the world's becoming. She claims that, I quote, for an oceanic sense of transcorporeality to be an ethical mode of being, the material self must not be a finished, self-contained product of evolutionary genealogies, but a site where the knowledges and practices of embodiment are undertaken as part of the world's becoming. An early proponent of hydrocriticism, Elizabeth Delore, interestingly notes that the Latin word vastus may refer to the scale of the ocean, but also designates waste, what is unwanted whether toxic waste absorbed by the water or the undesired beings locked up in camps. She draws a parallel between slave migration and the contemporary treatment of refugees and migrants, which the artist I'm focusing on explore. In the four projects, the sea features at once as a threatening natural force that will outlive man, as a poetic motive and a contact zone where power relations shape the destiny of human and non-human beings. Our connection with the sea is presented as shaped by cultural representations. The four works rely on what has been called hydro-imaginaries, that is to say how what we know about the oceans is partial, situated and shot through with imagination and desire. In inscriptions of an immense theater, water is imbued with the melancholy that Gaston Bachelard underscores in L'Eau et les Rêves, the dark water flowing but generating nothing but uncanny stillness is like the sticks um, connecting the realm of the living to the world of the dead. In Vertigo Sea, one might find um, a striking echo of Moby Dick in the words of a young migrant registered during a BBC radio program 
I quote him, I was in the sea and I saw this big, big fish and I thought I was going to be eaten. In Landlessness, Keating shoots images of the coast of Ireland and manipulates them to produce a paradoxical effect. As is the case in inscriptions of an immense theater and previous video work by Elvin Brain entitled Immigrant, the movement of the water is slowed down and stilled. The poetic manipulation of the films creates an impression of spatial and temporal suspension, which possibly evokes the trauma of exile. In the four works, the sea is not a seascape, it's endowed with a vital materiality. Um, Ayesha Hamid creates a constellation of representations around the sea, among which the powerful myth of the Black Atlantis, which she evokes through the music of the electro band Drexia. Legend has it that the female slaves who were thrown overboard by the traders and were pregnant, gave birth to infants able to adapt to their aquatic milieu. In one of her lectures or performances, the artist juxtaposed this myth to Turner's famous painting, Slavers Throwing Overboard the Dead and Dying, which supposedly commemorates the Zong massacre, um, which happened in 1781, if I remember well, uh, a tragic episode in the history of slavery, during which 130 slaves perished after having been thrown into the ocean as the ship sailed to Jamaica. Ayesha Hamid wonders why the master has chosen to depict a tempest, even though no document establishes the occurrence of a storm. Storms then become a point of entry to think about how nature and flux is involved in socio-historical inquiries, she explains. The sea takes on a metaphorical function. Hamid draws from Walter Benjamin's text, Mint's Tethys on the Philosophy of History, inspired from Paul Klee's drawing of the Angelus Novus, in which the angel of history is keyed to uh, progress through the metaphor of storms. Um, interestingly, at, uh, when John Comfra exhibited, uh, sh showed Vertigacy at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, uh, Vertigacy was screened next to um, Turner's masterpiece, uh, The Deluge. The painting inspired from the Bible emblematizes the aesthetic of the sublime, which filtered people's perception of natural environments. And here, obviously, the sea is viewed as hostile and much stronger than man. The eschatological nature of the scene recalls the vengeful waves in the Confra's works. Um, in inscriptions from an immense theater, Elvin Brain cinematographically floats the Enlightenment Gallery, a room dedicated to the construction of knowledge in the 18th century, at a time when colonization and the empire expanded. The presence of water reconnects the displays to colonial sea voyages. In the part that was shot in the direct provision camp, the presence of water turns the barracks into isolated and adrift units and reminds us that the sea is also territorialized, militarized, controlled by the states. The units might be likened to the penal colonies and islands of the past. Population flows are also regulated when people or goods reach shores, ports or quarantine zones. So while the sea may be viewed as a divine or natural force that compels man to contemplate his own vanity, it is also a contested territory. And I'd like to borrow from Marie-Louise Pratt's um, notion of contact zone to um, stress the fact that obviously the sea is where power relations materialize, but it is also a um, place for resistance where one can speak back using the language of the oppressor to deconstruct power relations. Marie-Louise Pratt underlines the importance of opportunities for exercising in storytelling and in identifying with the ideas, interests, histories, and attitudes of other, calling for experiments in transculturation, which avoid the pitfalls of the rhetorics of authenticity. Following this line of thought, one may view the dialogical praxis and the paradises as exercises in transculturation and the sea as a contact zone. Um, as Laura Winkle argues um, in Hydro Criticism, when history is seen not from the borders of the nation state, but from the open ocean, the vast expanses of water, counter histories can be written, premised on a past that is 
multiracial, multilingual, and international in its solidarities. Jean Macomfra um, noted, I quote him, if you say you're interested in formations of identity, and those formations of identity could be either of the racialized or sexualized or gender variety, then at some point, the space of the aquatic binds certain subjects together. Yet the bind is a double bind as the sea both generates solidarity and oppression. In Vertigo Sea, the sea is a route leading to unexplored places whose resources will be exploited and gradually depleted. Some archival footage document the killing of bears or whales and the massacres are connected to slavery and oppression. Images of the chilling death flights, opponents to the dictatorship of Pinochet thrown from planes flying across the ocean complement this harrowing evocation of human cruelty. And I'd like to show you a third excerpt from John Akamfra's video. I know the mate of a ship who purchased a young woman with a fine child of about a year old. In the night, the child cried much and disturbed his sleep. He rose up in great anger, tore the child from the mother, threw it into the sea. Why do I speak of one child when we have heard of over a hundred men cast into the sea? So uh, the term um, which um, I used in the title for my presentation is actually derived from a text by Christina Sharp. And uh, the term also features in this excerpt from Moby Dick, which uh, a conference quotes in Vertigo C. Um, so uh, in her essay, Christina Sharp, like the four um, artists I decided to focus upon, is sinking through slavery and its afterlives. She, sketches a semantic constellation and I'd like to quote this passage at length because I think it's extremely relevant to the four works um, I am um, well analyzing. Um, so wakes are processes through them we think about the dead and about our relations to them their rituals through which to enact grief and memory. Wakes allow those among the living to mourn the passage of the dead for ritual they're watching, they are the watching of relatives and friends beside the body of the deceased from death to burial, and the accompanying drinking, feasting, and other observ observances, a watching practiced as a religious observance. But wakes are also the track left on the water's surface by a ship, the disturbance caused by a body swimming, or one that is moved in water, the air currents behind a body in flight a region of disturbed flow in the line of sight, an observed object, and something in the line of recoil of a gun. Finally, wake means being awake and also consciousness. In the wake, the semiotics of the slave ship continue from the forced movements of the enslaved to the forced movement of the migrant and the refugee, to the regulation of black people in North American street and neighborhoods, to those ongoing crossings 
and of sorry and drownings in the Mediterranean Sea, to the brutal colonial reimaginings of the slave ship and the ark, to the reappearances of the slave ship in everyday life in the form of the prison, the camp, and the school. As we go about wake work, we must think through containment, regulation, punishment, capture, and captivity, and the ways of the manifold representations of blackness became the symbol par excellence for the less than human being condemned to death. While this text obviously spins connections that surface in the four artistic projects, it also brings to the fore the lacuna in archives, the blanks left by history when it is written and traced back by the oppressors, the accumulated erasures, projections, fabulations, and misnamings. Accordingly, I would like to lay stress on the metaphorical rifts between the images, the sounds, the screams, and the voices, which encapsulates this lacuna in the four installations. So the space separating the screens in the installations, the blank screens interspersed between images or chapters, the visual or sound discrepancies, all materializes spaces of difference in the radian terminology. Um, the large uh, screens um, that are used in the apparatuses chosen by the artists um, elicit an impression of inclusion or immersion for the viewers who find themselves at the center of a flux of relations. What a confra notes about his multi-channel video installations is equally valid for the three other projects. I quote him, it's a format of debate, he explains, taking place literally in front of you all the time, not sequentially, but almost materially from the beginning to end. I love the democratizing function of it. Not two people at one time feel the same about what they are watching because not two people are watching the same thing. Um, in the case of um, Marion Keating's works, the display of screens partakes of a dialogical aesthetics in that the viewer is positioned between the two screens, traveling back and forth from one perspective to another. In A Beautiful Dream, for instance, Marion Keating evokes the long processes which led to the independence of Ireland and introduces Marcus Garvey, the founder of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, which supported the Irish fight for independence, declaring, we believe Ireland should be free, even as Africa shall be free for the Negroes of the world. These lines of convergences, the common fate of colonized people, find a visual equivalent in the visual installation. Multi-screen installations can indeed be viewed as archipelagos. Dominique Payani compares them to I quote him in French, une organisation d'îles dont les intervalles font partie de l'ensemble. La mer et la terre, les vides et les pleins participent autant à la réalité de l'archipel. So this rhizome-like construction or constellation allows for ethical and aesthetic decentedness. It bears the imprint of the dialogical praxis. The notion of decentedness and uncentredness have often been deployed in the field of post-colonial literature and cultural studies. It underlies the poetry of Aimé Césaire and the writings of Edouard Glissant. It is at the core of the curatorial strategies of Oquien Wazor. The two notions have more seldom been used in the realm of the visual um, arts. Um, but decentedness is a critical strategy which produces an aesthetics of in-betweenness. It brings forth discrepancies and dissonance rather than hybridity and creolization. Such discrepancy parallels the method of anthropology as the outlines of each ideology are altered by the contact with others so that each set of ID is both singular and part of a whole. So I hope my presentation of the four works has evidenced the, the relevance and significance of montage and video installation in producing decentedness. And to conclude this presentation, um, I would like to um, quote from Donna Haraway, who, um, like TJ Demos and Felix Guattari, call for a decentered approach to nature. Let me quote this passage. Nature is not just a physical place to which one can go, or a treasure to fence in or to bank, or an essence to be saved or violated. Nature is not hidden, and so it does not need to be unveiled. Nature is not a text to be read in the codes of mathematics and biomedicine. It is not the other, 
who offers origin, replenishment, and service. Neither mother, nurse, lover, nor slave, nature is not matrix, resource, mirror, or tool for the reproduction of that old, ethnocentric, phallocentric, putatively being called man. We must find another relationship to nature besides reification, possession, appropriation, and nostalgia. No longer able to sustain the fictions of being either subjects or objects, all the partners in the potent conversations that constitute nature must, must find a new ground for making meanings together. And I think that the polyphony embedded in the apparatuses chosen by the four artists provide a new ground for obviously thinking, rethinking, and envisioning nature. Thank you very much for this, uh, for your attention. And um, well, I, I'm sorry that uh, we have not been able to uh, show excerpts from Elvini Brain's um, inscriptions of an immense theater. She's an artist um, who uh, works in a very precise, um, acute way on images, including many details in her videos. And she thought it was, um, well, she, the, the, the video might um, lose so much in quality that it wasn't worth uh, screening them. But I invite you to visit her uh, website and see um, one excerpt, at least from um, inscriptions of an immense theater. Um, this talk will be followed by um, the screening of one excerpt from Landlessness by Marion Keating. Uh, so I will turn to her and thank her again very warmly for her presence this evening. Yeah. Hi. Hi so let, yeah. So um, I have already introduced you to um, the audience. Um, so um, well, you worked a lot in London and then um, in, in the west of Ireland. And thanks to the residencies that uh, you had in Jamaica and the Barbados, um, you led investigations on the plight of Irish indented workers. And um, I thank you very warmly for accepting to show one excerpt from Landlessness. Um, maybe you would like to introduce this excerpt or say a few things about the video. Sure. Um, so landlessness is normally a dual screen video presentation. Um, so for this short excerpt, I've put it into a single channel format. And what you'll be viewing is the last um, three and a half minutes of part one and the first three and a half minutes of part two. Um, part one deals with the socioeconomic conditions of Ireland and Irish people at the time and the rationale for their recruitment as indentured labourers to Jamaica. Um, indentured labourers was um, I suppose the process of recruiting laborers to um, after the abolition of enslavement, they was there was a labor void in the plantations. So they recruited Irish to fill these labor voids. Um, this indenturement is a process where the person willingly signs up to um, a contract of three to five years to work on the plantations um, in return for um, transport to a new um, life in a new island. Um, and the second part deals with the rationale for their recruitment in Jamaica. So the sound is a little bit intermittent, so it comes in and goes again. So just in case you're watching it and you think it's your computer. So, yeah, if you want to go. Um, maybe for everyone to situate you, uh, could you go back to uh, the very beginning of your interest in this issue of immigration? Was it when you um, landed in fresh milk in Jamaica that you started to excavate and unearth this long history uh, that was unknown about Irish immigration? Yeah, it started, it was quite random how it began. Um, in 2013, I was invited by the artist Joy Gregory to participate in a new residency that was being set up in Jamaica, um, and it was called the Beach House Residency Programme. And it was, while I was there, I was actually researching a different um, area of interest. While we were there, we were researching Trevor Owen, who is a fashion designer um, from Jamaica, and the residency was being held in his house. And he had represented Jamaica in New York Fashion Week in the 1960s, was friends with Errol Flynn and all these people. And basically when he died, his archive was left in the house. So we were there actually to un um, uncover information about him. But it was while I was there, I started to notice the Irish connection. So I started to notice that in Patois, which is like the local language, um, they used Irish words, Gaelic words. So like Pat, um, Gansey, which means jumper in Irish, was used in Jamaican Patois. And, and I was quite 
confused by this. I didn't understand how a language during Ireland's colonial rule by Britain, which was almost eradicated, had managed to cross, cross the Atlantic Ocean and was being used in this language. And um, I just thought it was quite, to me, I had never heard of any Irish Jamaican connections. And then I started to notice different Irish place names around Jamaica, um, places called Irish Town, places called Clamel, Wexford, Wicklow. So I started to kind of know that there was, there's something here, but I couldn't um, work out where it came from, what time period it all began or whatever else. So after that initial residency, I went back to Ireland. Um, I was based in London and I did started doing research in Irish the National Archives. And no one seemed to know anything about the Irish Jamaican connection. And they were constantly redirecting me to Barbados to an earlier time period, to the 1630s, 40s, when the Irish had um, traveled as political prisoners to Barbados. And um, it was only through kind of intense archival research that I started to uncover pieces of information. Um, there had only really been one article written by um, a man that was published in the 1980s, which talked about a controversy surrounding the last ship of indentured laborers to sail from Ireland in 1841, where a court case had happened in Limerick. And over the space of six weeks, the um, vessel, which was full of 700 indentured laborers, um, when they realized that there was inaccuracies in the contracts of the people of what they'd signed. And what they'd said was that there was Catholic churches in Jamaica, which there wasn't at the time. And um, an ex-editor of the Jamaican Dispatch newspaper happened to be passing through Limerick at the time and said, this is inaccurate. If this is inaccurate, I don't know how much the rest of the documentation is false. So this public hearing happened in Limerick and um, it was argued out by four different sides where the public were invited to attend and they could withdraw from the indenture if they chose to. Um, after six weeks, the vessel left and um, with, I think it was 121 people on board and they set sail for Jamaica to work on the plantations. And because of this controversy, I managed to kind of have a time period of when I knew the Irish had gone to Jamaica. So um, I went back to the Jamaican archives and I just literally started going page by page through those books of that time period. Because you have to remember with um, colonial archives, they're not, they're not done in a, you can't Google search what you're looking for. So why were things recorded? It's normally to do with monetary reasons, capitalism, and you have to start to look at the history through the reasons why it would have been recorded. Um, the other massive issue that I came across with trying to uncover this history, further uncover it, um, was because in 1921, during the Irish Civil War, um, the four courts in Dublin was bombed. And this was also where we stored our whole national archive. So 95% of all Irish records were destroyed. So we don't have a lot of our own um, cultural history. Um, because we were a colony of Britain at the time, there is do some documentation in the um, London archives, but it's you're piecing it together from all these different kind of what I call like triangular mapping, where you're taking what's missing in one archive and trying to fill it with um, information from another to try and put this whole history together. Um, so I suppose that was kind of how it started. And then um, from there, I suppose, in the Jamaican archives, I managed to find um, a report where they demanded a full investigation of what was the condition of the Irish indentured laborers, um, where had they ended up going, um, because the British government was afraid that they would be accused of um, continuing enslavement in some form or other and they wanted to make sure that the Jamaican plantocracy which were also pretty much the ruling assembly of the country were not doing illicit acts to try and recruit a new labor force um, so through these documents I managed to locate plantations where the Irish settled and then I traveled to those areas and tried to find information about people that live there Mm -hmm. Thank you. So did you know in this very early phase of your work how those documents would be made visible in your artistic project? No, um, the, it, it was quite a complicated. So I suppose this body of work has been developing since 2013. So it's kind of like a seven, eight year period of work, whatever. Um, but I wasn't, because it was an, pretty much an un, unknown history or a hidden history, I didn't have the information to even know what I was trying to produce. 
So I would literally go to Jamaica. I was spending three to six months a year there. I would start to uncover traces of information, but I may not find another clue till two years later that made that piece of information make sense. So um, at the time I was doing a lot more text-based work and I started to incorporate more video-based work because I, didn't know how I could gather all this information together and put it out to a public audience when I didn't even know what my, I didn't know where I was going because when you have a hidden history, you don't know what you're trying to put forward. So every time I would visit different locations, I would do a lot of filming. So then as I gradually got kind of more of a constructed narrative together, I could then go back to these video archives and start to pull the information to form um, these kind of, I suppose, descriptions of these events. And I suppose on another note as well, there is probably about 13 films that kind of form this body of works at the moment. And they're all told um, in relation to the archive from where they're taken from. So landlessness is from a colonial archive. So the viewer um, is very distanced to it. They're removed, they're reading um, this history. Um, whereas the other film, which you talked about briefly, um, they don't do much in the cane hole way, where Will V. Bormer, who's a descendant of Irish and German indentured laborers, um, it's a living history. So she is the embodiment of that history. So mm -hmm. that film, instead of I've hours and hours of interviews of, with her, where she knows quite a lot about her family history, but to me, she was more important than um, her grand uncle or whatever else. So. It started to become, um, the film is actually filmed just on my iPhone as we spend a day cooking in her kitchen and then go outside into the garden and she talks to me about the different vegetation that she is growing. And you can see the, the, the family graves are present within the video. So it kind of, um, each, each film deals with a specific type of archive and a specific type of information. So mm -hmm. none of them are kind of the same in that sense. Yeah, and the excerpt that you decided to show, um, I think, illustrates how the documentary and the poetic are interwoven in your works with great attention paid to sounds. Would you like to comment upon how you work with sounds, how you record sounds when working in Jamaica, and then how you manipulate sound and images to, to produce the works afterwards? Yeah, I think um, it, it all depends on what the, the film is and what that angle, specific angle is. Um, most of the films have five one surround sounds, so you're completely immersed within the sound space, um, which to me is extremely important um, because history, you can't, like, I would never have been able to understand um, what I was trying to understand from just reading books. You need to be immersed in it. And just simple things that, like, when um, you're in Jamaica, there's often... Um, chickens walking around and things like that. And just for the viewer to be in a space where they can hear a chicken walk behind them, because that is the reality. And that is um, that is what you're trying to encapsulate. So you're trying to give the viewer um, an understanding um, of the place and the history and um, everything else. So I think all those kind of things start to come together and yeah, develop that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, looking again at the uh, the passage in which you manipulate the uh, images of water to suggest that there is both displacement and motionlessness uh, is really interesting. Um, I think it transforms the experience of migration into um, maybe something akin to exile. And exile is not a word that is generally applied to forced um, migratory flows, whether that of the indentured workers back um, in the colonial period or contemporary migrations. Um, I think that the notion of exile has also to a certain extent be appropriated by Irish culture. Um, how do you, well, do you think that the notion of exile is present in the way you film and show migration in landlessness? I think um, maybe not exile as a word. I think as well there's, I think, history is such a complicated thing. And a lot of the indentured laborers re-migrated to other countries and other places. So um, the reason why the information is not known in Ireland is the Great Famine happened, um, had already begun to, to kind of take hold of Ireland, but five years later it had decimated Ireland. And by decimating um, the communities and the families and the networks, um, people who had gone to Jamaica um, were 
kind of not forgotten, but not spoken of, because those that had survived the famine had survivor guilt. And it's called the silence, um, which is kind of a period of about 30 years after the famine where no one spoke of the past or it spoke of um, kind of any of those moments. So um, in a way, I would say because indenture um, was a, it was still a choice, whether there was um, misinterpretations within the contracts, um, when if the Irish um, didn't like their 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 um, the person that they were working for in Jamaica, if they absconded, they were very often not captured or chased or brought back, because they were also white, and that is something that also needs to be addressed. Is that they had they might have been recruited in Ireland because they were lower class laborers to the British colony. They Ireland was overpopulated. They needed to um, reduce the population. And this was a way to, um, to lower the population rate in Ireland, but also to increase the white population in Jamaica, which after abolition, the white plantocracy were now extremely worried for their position. So in that sense, they used one colony to, to re kind of um, populate the labor force in that way to strengthen the white position. Um, so if the white indentured laborers did run away, um, they could very quickly assimilate into the, um, the white laboring class within Jamaica. And that is also something that needs to be um, acknowledged when discussing that. But if also they decided to leave Jamaica after a number of years, if they went to America, if they went to another island, um, that conversation would not have returned to Ireland because why would you go back to a country that's been, the population has been halved in the space of five years um, through a famine. So um, I don't know if um, exile is a word that I would use, but I think mass emigration has become ingrained in the culture of Irish life. Like I left Ireland during the recession in 2011. I'm part of that migratory process that, um, it's it's just it's part of where we are now, and that's why the Irish are all over the world. So I think that yes, migration is ingrained in the systemic understanding of Irish people, and it is not a shock for someone to say that their daughter or son has left. Um, so I think that has become part of our culture, very much so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, I'd like to leave enough time for the audience to ask questions as well. So, um, well, um, Camila, maybe would you like to pick up some of the questions that have been asked in the chat or? Um, yes, um, there were some um, questions just to precise a couple of things. Uh, Johannes, maybe you would like to ask it yourself or shall I? Um, well, I think so, it's so, you do because ahead, I haven't had time yeah, to ahead. look at the chat. <laughs> <laughs> so the question was um, um, just could you please precise Marianne the name of, ja of, uh, of Jamaican designer that you've been referring to is it um, Hazel uh, Rockney Blackman no Trevor Owen Trevor Owen okay and uh, how many um, how big is the number of uh, um, Irish immigrants uh, uh, estimated number uh, of the immigrants in, in Jamaica we don't actually have any idea. Um, we know there is because of the um, kind of report that was created as a result of the controversy of the sailing. We have a list of about seven or eight passenger ships with um, the ages of the family members and, you know, the uh, male, female, what their labor oftenly they were. Um, they didn't have um, a an occupation and they were just um, blank and their children, whatever else. But we don't have a specific number. There's no Irish diaspora community in Jamaica. It's not like a pocket of people that have interconnected um, because it very much was a creolization process where the, the just different cultures just merged into um, the melting pot that is Jamaica as such. Um, so we don't actually know full, um, and I don't want to throw out a number, um, but it's also interesting to note that even though the last sailing of Irish indentured labourers from Ireland to Jamaica was in 1841, they continued to migrate from, they would travel to England or to Scotland and migrate from there. So because on these, these information wasn't recorded by the colonial office, so we don't have um, these records to know it for sure. But in, within Jamaica, I frequently meet people who know that their great-great-grandmother was Irish or their great-great-grandfather was Irish. So it's, it's 
far more frequent. Um, that makes me think that it was a, a large enough number, but I would just not like to guess. Thank you. I think I will give the microphone to Johannes because he has a more complicated question to Valérie about Afrofuturism. So I, I, I let him ask it himself. Johannes, are you with us? Well, I mean, thank. I mean, thank you. No, I, first of all, I would like to acknowledge the wonderful uh, presentation by Valérie. Uh, it's fascinating. And it was just an observation because I felt you were making some fascinating links to the sea in relationship maybe to outer space and the way Sun Ra and other Afrofuturists felt there was no place for black people on this, on this earth. So maybe one way would be to emigrate far away. And I, this rang a bell with me having watched this British um, program on BBC called Dark Matter. And maybe you have seen that too with the Trexica connection? Well, I haven't seen the BBC um, doc documentary. Um, I have no time to, to, to stress the, this aspect of um, Ayesha Hamid's work because, um, well, my preoccupation was to find common points between the, the, the four works. Um, and I think that they're uh, obvious, but um, yeah, she, she really mixes um, past science fiction <laughs> Um, because, well, um, um, Sun Ra's uh, biographic film was made in, in yeah, the mid-1970s, um, and the very contemporary use of the Black Atlantis myth by this um, electro music group. So I think that her approach to this issue is really achronic. She, she really mixes different times, including past projections into the future and our contemporary project projection back into the past. So um, the temporal complexity of her approach to those issues is really fascinating. I'm not sure I answer your question very precisely. Oh, thank you very much. Um, thank you. There was a question from Norian Kerbrett. Norian, would you like to ask it yourself? It was a, I don't know if Norian still with us about, is a question about Albini Brain's work. What is the essential feature of her to create this timeless effect, this moment in between what, um, that she's trying? When looking at her work, I feel the movement, but also the stillness of the image, mm. which is at the same time really mystifying and incredibly clever. Yes, um, well, um, Elvie would have uh, answered your question more convincingly, obviously, but she, um, stillness and uh, the, the slowness of um, the movements and the objects that she super, well, superimposes on the, the backgrounds is extremely important in her work. Um, she associates that with a state of uh, suspension and the dreamlike quality of her works. Um, because obviously it well, goes against the swift rhythm of our lives and also the, um, if, you, if you take into account the speed of movement in today's films, for instance, or the hectic rhythm of our lives, uh, there's a very strong contrast when you see her films in terms of rhythm. So um, to her, it is mostly a way of um, yeah, bringing the viewers into another world uh, and she, it, she uh, also um, explains how difficult it is to slow down all the small objects, sometimes just particles of dust that she insets or embeds in, in the video. So it's uh, a great part of her work and uh, an access to, um, well, something that is deeply um, poetic and strange and canny in her uh, works. And um, I think there's an interesting parallel with the way, Marianne, you, you slow down the movement of the sea uh, in uh, inscriptions of an immense theater, because the water is moving, there's a flow uh, that is a constant flow, but um, you know, the, the, the objects in the scene are not moving. So uh, there's this contradictory um, association of stillness and movement, 
which leads us to, well, something that is metaphorical and poetic, but that has to do maybe with the impossibility of overcoming the trauma of history, of moving forward, and uh, the desire yeah, to, to go away from this traumatic history, the legacy of, um, well, slavery or forced migration, and the fact that it constantly resurfaces. So um, I think this paradoxical effect in terms of movement is particularly related to the impossibility of, well, bypassing those tragic episodes of history. I don't know, Marion, how you um, would analyze both Elvie's use of slowness and your own um, use of slowness in, in landlessness. Um, I don't speak too much about Alva's work because I feel yeah. like I know it probably enough. Um, I suppose within my work, when you're actually watching it as a dual screen film, you see one screen is activated with the text that you saw and on the other screen for the whole duration of that half, which is about 13 minutes, um, you just see the ocean because it's trying to um, remind you of this constant migration. This wasn't something that happened once, it's happened over and over and over again and continues mm -hmm. to this day. Um, but also migration has never changed. It's always been about this desire um, to better, like do as best you can for your life and to change and to kind of move forward. So the fundamentals of why the people left as Irish indentured laborers was they didn't have enough food to eat, they couldn't sustain living in Ireland, and they went to Jamaica in the hope for a better life. Better life. And I think that's the thing about um, when migration is a choice. And no matter whether it's socioeconomic condition or not, if you have the choice to make yourself, um, whereas it, in regards to enslavement, that was in a completely different um, form um, because that wasn't a choice and that was a generational thing um, that was handed down. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there is a question from uh, Juliette Touge on the power of the sea and uh, uh, on Confra Vertigo Sea. Is it a way to demonstrate the power of the sea? She asks how humans and sometimes even animals cannot dominate it. Migrants drawing dead birds floating at the surface, the huge crashing waves and the depth of the ocean. Um, well, I'm going to give, obviously, my, my answer, not a comfort one, uh, but um, there are many images uh, in vertigo sea of um, shoals of fish and a thriving uh, fauna in, well, in the ocean. Um, I think that, um, yeah, you can see also um, jellyfish thriving and, yeah, so I don't think he's trying to oppose the, the milieu and the fauna thriving in the, the oceans. I think that to him, it's one and the same thing. Um, he has spoken quite um, repeatedly about the interconnection of natural um, elements and, well, animal and human life. So I don't think he would make a difference in terms of survival or chances of survival in the Anthropocene between the sea and the species that are thriving there. Um, what comes out of vertigo sea is really that nature will outlive us anyway and that life will adapt to new forms. So it's not an, uh, a pessimistic view of the Anthropocene, but it is one that is not man-centered. Um, we have several questions about the sound. Uh, uh, Anlar, would you like to ask uh, your question? Yes, but, but I think Ramona had a question first. Uh, she raised her hand. Uh, would you like to right. ask? Sorry. It doesn't really matter. Ramona? But, um... I, 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 actually, I had a, a question uh, to you, Marianne, uh, about um, uh, the, first of all, the status of the written word. Uh, in you know as part of the archive or as a counterpoint to the archive uh, or counter model I don't know uh, uh, in the installation that you showed us and also um, the importance of uh, sounds of sounds of the soundtrack so I, I'd like to know whether you'd like to say a bit more about those 
Thank you. Yeah, I suppose, um, so the text is taken from multiple sources. So the Irish side, um, I might let Valerie pronounce um, Alex de Trockville's name properly. Um, I'm, I'm sure I'm not saying it right. Um, but it's based on his writings of journaling to um, England and Ireland, um, which he recorded in 1935 or 1835, sorry. Um, there's actually very little source material about what Ireland was like at the time. Um, so this kind of became where um, the script was taken from and adapted to kind of fit um, with the narrative um, of what this space, I, I, the pace that people can read at, and also trying to put it over to an audience a huge amount of information, which is quite hard to, it takes a lot of the audience member to sit there and to read all this text. Um, but it's also how can I, how could I convey all this information to an audience um, in a very short period of time um, so they could understand what they were reading. Um, and I, I recorded it first with voiceovers. I was, to, will I get actors to record the voices? I tried all these different um, approaches, but I felt by having actors read them, you gave, you had to, there had to be so many specific choices made in regards to their age, to their, I suppose their class, to their everything else. So to me, I felt by having, um, what I would call intertitles more so kind of um, than subtitles. They're placed in the center of the screen. One person is speaking at one side and the other voice is coming from the other so that um, the viewer can kind of um, can envision and read and imagine for themselves what these people look like and what they sounded like. Um, the second part of the film, which deals with Jamaica, is based on documents I found in the National Archives in Jamaica and London, and they're compiled together to form these conversations. Um, so they're not, as um, Valerie was talking about, documentary. I wouldn't call them documentary, because even though they're based on um, archival documents and um, the truth behind them, they're also composed in these different ways where I have used my artistic freedom to actually form them as conversations as a way to um, to get this information to the audience. I think the sound with landlessness is quite hard to um, listen to when you're viewing it on a screen, um, like a computer screen. It's more about um, being in the space and then you feel it different, differently. Um, it's kind of, you're also hearing quite a loud bit of the film, um, but it's like in other parts, you're just hearing birds tweeting, you're just hearing this kind of very atmospheric kind of information. Um, but the reason why when, when you see the, the migratory boats going to Jamaica and all the sites that I've used are actual sites that were recorded of where the Irish transported through. So the, the port where we're coming into um, was known as Bluefields and this is where a lot of the Irish entered into Jamaica. So you're actually seeing what they would have seen for the first time as they arrived in Jamaica, their first view of this island that they'd no idea what, um, coming from Ireland, what heat is, you know, kind of what was this climate that they were going into. And um, you have the sound of this roaring kind of petrol engine because migration still continues and it's not something that just exists in the past. But I am also an artist and I am present and I'm also telling part of this narrative and I'm not trying to create um, this kind of um, historical film where you are transported and it is 1840. This is recorded in the present day. This is my journey to try and uncover the truth of this history, if that makes sense. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, if I may just add a few um, remarks, I, I, I know you're uneasy with the term documentary um, and, and that, that was also part of the, the questions I wanted to ask. Um, I think it applies variously, obviously, to, to your works uh, and I related it to um, yeah, a riotous assembly, for example, in which you, you excavate also photographic archives. But uh, again, I think that um, sound is really essential in your work and it allows the viewer to focus on your presence, um, the presence of the artist recording, re well, the traces of the past, recording sounds and giving voice to, to nature, to the landscape. And I think that the excerpt that you showed, showed uh, really illustrates this poetic take that you have starting from archive as the content, but then manipulating them um, and, and adding layers of subjective interpretation and yeah, understanding of what started as 
an, a research, yeah, an investigation. Mm. Yeah, no, I agree with us. Yep. Um, thank you so much, Marianne and Valerie. I guess I um, I wanted to sort of jump in and continue on that question of both um, the sonic, but also um, on how you actually um, sort of developed this particular approach to kind of um, re-engaging the archive or, or or creating a kind of artistic version of the archive in in a way. Mm -hmm. So on the one level, what I thought was really interesting about the Sonic, what I really felt even on my uh, crappy computer audio that I had here was um, that um, it really brought not just, I mean, like you were talking about immersion and sound, and I think that's true, but at the same time, I think especially at the beginning and in these very loud parts, um, you kind of feel um, the waves in a way, kind of going back and forth between the two speakers. Um, and um, and it kind of gives you, it actually made me feel slightly nauseous. And so um, that, and that must be so much more impressive and wonderful when you're actually in the space and experiencing this. So I was really interested in this question that Valerie brought up and in connection to your work and her talk about the idea of displacement, that that's also this feeling of actually not being, you know, sound locates you, but in this case, it also dislocates you, which is precisely what you're trying to um, kind of trace in your um, in your research. So I thought it was a really wonderful way in which these two sort of um, came together. And I was wondering how long it took you to actually um, you know, if this if this started as a research project to find this format as the kind of optimal format to um, to really present this instead of you know writing a book or um, or doing something else, I think um, I'm I'm an artist first and foremost, and that's what I do. Um, like I have completed a PhD on this body of research, but I'm still an artist. That's what I would say I am. Um, also, the, another reason for this approach, I suppose, is I'm both dyslexic and dyspraxic. So I feel that this history has already been removed from um, the public in many ways because it is um, hidden as such. Um, and now that it's been uncovered, I wanted to make sure that it wasn't just an academic text that was kept for just a small group of people that they may read. I wanted it to be engaged by the public. I wanted it to be engaged by children. I wanted it to be engaged by people from multiple countries. And although at the same time, it's still within um, gallery situations and things like that, it's about allowing the public to come in and acknowledge, um, to kind of, I suppose, learn about this history and to open discussion, um, which I feel sometimes that um, to me is extremely important. And how can you, convey um like i think landlessness which you've seen is quite text-based heavy but a lot of the other films there's a lot more music in them there's a lot more rhythm and it's a it's a way to bring your audience in and inform them so to me um like landlessness came about actually extremely quickly as such i had been researching um for a couple of years so i started 2013 so 2017 was when the film was made but part one in Ireland, I filmed in the space of about six weeks and I wrote the script and then I went to Jamaica and I filmed the other half and then I came back and while I was filming it in Jamaica, I was also, it was part of the editing process and it was actually shown as um, in a gallery, I think four days after I came back from Jamaica. So it was actually a very, very intense, quick process. So um yeah, it was kind of um, it was a it was a really good way to start the actual practice based research part of it, because I had to just make decisions really, really fast. And I think that um, helped with how I approached the research, um, because I would say I'm an artist researcher, but um, how do I get this information across? And I, I thought personally, because there was so much text in it, that people um, wouldn't People normally only view video work for three minutes and then they move on to the next piece of work or whatever else. And I was actually really surprised at the opening night that everyone just sat in silence on beanbags and read, read the film for the 26 minutes duration. And some people stayed to watch it again. And I was not expecting that reaction at all. I didn't think, I wasn't sure if the format with the text would work. And um, I was quite surprised by the audience. So I think that's the thing where you also have to give the audience a lot of credit. Um, for that participation within it, um, if that makes sense. Okay, uh, 
do we have any more questions? Uh, we're drawing towards the end of uh, this uh, wonderful webinar that we've been having. So uh, uh, let us give a big thanks to Valérie and Marianne again, and a big uh, round of applause. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Use the small icons as well. <laughs> um, and uh, I will um, uh, leave it to uh, Anna uh, to disclose the contents of the next uh, seminar to be held because uh, this first seminar was part of a series of three. Uh, so thank you very much again, Valérie and Marianne. And uh, Anna, would you thank like you. to... Yes, let me just yeah echo um, our gratitude. This has been a wonderful uh, first session. I was really uh, exciting um, to follow this and be a part of this. And we're expecting you all back on October 12th. We'll be um, welcoming Helen Scales, a marine biologist from Cambridge. He co-authored a book on Jason DeCaris Taylor's underwater sculptures. He will also be joining us um, to talk about um, his latest projects along with Al Grument from Artworks for Change, a really um, fascinating um, um, collective that uh, engages in online exhibitions of um, water art, among other things. So we'll send out a, an, another invite with the, the new link and, and more precise information, but we're looking forward to seeing you back. And in between times, um, don't hesitate to, yeah, let us know your thoughts and your suggestions and works that we would find interesting for our project. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you again, Anna, for all the energy that you poured into this project and the organization of this seminar. It's a pleasure. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>